So, question, uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, what animal is the beast most like? Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. You already know, yeah. You can read it, but the beast is most like unto a leopard. Uh, Revelation 13, verse 2, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion, the dragon gave him power, seat, and great authority. So he's got pieces of other animals, but the bulk of him is like a leopard. Okay. Who was the leopard? Which kingdom did it symbolize? In Daniel, which, yeah. Greece. So Revelation 13 is speaking about the papacy, but it says the papacy is most like the leopard, which was Greece. And if you look at Roman Catholic thought, you will realize that their theology, their philosophy is all based off of Greek philosophy. That's what it is. And and their greatest thinkers, they base all their stuff right off of. And if you go through, um, at least in the in the in the in the Middle Ages, it was like this. I don't know if they still do, but they probably do. In order to go through and be a a minister or not minister, priest you got to go through years of Greek philosophy before you even really get deep into the Bible. And the idea was that we'll get you so embedded in the Greek mindset that when you approach the scriptures, you can't even understand it because you're approaching it like a Greek. They're conditioned. Okay. So we know that that's their thought. And, and that's even, you know, you look at, like, the, the, their, their fathers of their theology, and they're all very, you know, they base their stuff on Aristotle and Plato and all that stuff. Okay, so that's them. How much of the world is tricked by Roman Catholic thought? Revelation 18, verse 23. Revelation 18, 23. Uh, where is it? Am I in the right place? Yes. There you go. For the, Yeah, all nations were deceived by their sorceries. 1823. 1823. No, 1820. At the end of 1823. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Okay. Now, if you guys have ever, I don't know if you guys have ever known anybody who gotten, who's gotten a philosophy degree, you know, okay? If you ask somebody who's gotten a philosophy degree, I have a friend, and, or if you've taken philosophy in college, philosophy means the study or the love of knowledge, right? But when you go into our school system and you study philosophy, you don't study any type of knowledge, you study Greek thought. It's all Greek thought. It's all Greek philosophy. There's different ways of thinking, but they don't even tell you. They don't go and say, well, this is how the Hebrews thought, and this is how the Native Americans thought. They They don't care. It's just straight beeline to Aristotle and Plato. And then all the ones who came after them, all the, you know, the, the more like the Germans and the European ones, they're all their mindset is all based on Aristotle and Plato and all them. So it's, you only get Greek philosophy. So by definition, in our schools, philosophy means Greek mindset. So what I would suggest is that most of us have been raised in such an atmosphere of the Greek mindset that it's second nature. We don't even realize it. And in the Hebrew, it's completely different. Go ahead. Well, I definitely say that the the Jews in general were influenced by the Greeks about 200 years before Christ. Greek thought had conquered the world, and the Romans had pretty much just adopted Greek thought 
and you know, but it was that was the Greek was the language of the day, even in Rome's day, and it was the thought process of the day. And so, yeah, Paul had to when he was a Pharisee, he would have definitely been molded with this Greek mindset, and he would have to get rid of it, you know, and and get out of it when he was converted. Uh, so yeah, it's it's that's something that's yeah okay. So it's all around us. So what's the difference? What's the difference between Hebrew and Greek mindset? So this is something that's it's a little tricky to put your finger on. I can give you guys a few examples, and it's not all black and white. There's some there's some overlap, but generally there's a few ways that you and you can look this up online, and you'll see a lot of people saying the same basic thing on the differences between the two. Um, but I think, yeah, one of the best ways is just to look at examples. So, for example, the Greeks were very idealistic about their, it was a logic and abstract and thought-based. And they had very, what they thought of as, as things that were pure. So, for example, just give you guys an example. When the Greeks studied um, the stars, they assumed everything on earth was corrupted and wicked and not quite perfect, but everything in heaven was perfect. And so it was a given that the rotation of any planets would be a perfect circle because everything in heaven, the ideal, is perfect, right? Now, we know now that that's not how it works. They're elliptical. They're a little bit off. It's a little bit more natural, the, the, the orbits of the planets and the orbits, of, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, but the Greeks could not fathom that. They started from an opinion of what they considered was the ideal, and they reasoned from there. And so it wasn't reality determines what's truth, it's their thought, their logic, and truth must bend to that. You guys see that? See what I'm saying? But it was a logical idea. They had logical reasons for it, but it was false. But it, was, it, it appeared logical, right? And that was king. So, I mean, think of, like, the people at Mars Hill. They would just sit around and just talk and just talk idea, because they loved ideas. And so these ideas were paramount in their mind. What they set up as logical, that's king. Hebrew, completely different. In Hebrew, everything's based on reality. They were an agricultural society, not a philosopher society. They were what works, you know, what actually works. And when they would make, um, everything was an analogy based on reality. So the entire Old Testament, you read it, and it's just all of it's like analogies. When you read Greek, there's a lot of words for abstract thoughts that you just don't even have a word for that in Hebrew because they just don't think that that abstractly like that. It's just reality-based. And so you, you kind of get this, and you think of how we're told in the spirit of prophecy our school system's supposed to be, right? And, and you know, that you can go and you get all into this abstract stuff, and she's like, no, teach the kids how to work. And it's just reality-based, right? And that's, what was the original education? The garden. You know, it was reality. Part of the domain that you were thinking, like a Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, um, and you even see this in the languages. So, okay. So, because the Greek was very abstract, they had, they had things that were ideals that they considered, if you break those ideals and this logic, it's a sin. Right? So, they had these, everything fit in a nice little box, a little logical box. Everything was black and white and fit in a nice little box. Whereas Hebrew it was more organic and it was more... There's a little bit of overlap, but, but not on things that were important. So let me give you guys an example. I go to uh, Proverbs 26, verse 4 and 5. And I could give, like, I could give multiple examples of this in the, in the Old Testament. Proverbs 26, verse 4 and 5. Okay, just to contrast this with the Greek idea, have you guys ever heard the saying that God can God, the question is, can God make a rock so heavy that he can't pick it up? That's Greek mindset. That's this, there's this ideal and you have these words that just can't work together. 
And the Hebrews just wouldn't even like, that's just a dumb question. Why would you even, you know what I mean? It's just not like, that's just, why would you even think of that? You know, there's no point to even thinking like that. The Greeks give you this like, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Kind of like, who cares? You know? And so, because they're worried about these little ideals that don't matter. Okay, so Proverbs 26, verse 4 and 5. Can somebody read it for us? I love those verses. Two verses, one right after another, and if you approach it from a what, and, and you could say Greek, but you can also just say Western, because Western mindset is Greek mindset. So when we approach it from our Western mindset, those verses seem contradictory, right? One seems to directly contradict the other. The Hebrews had no problem with it, no problem at all. You know, <laughs> And I think that's one of the things that we, and this is one of the problems with theology, uh, systematic theology sometimes is we try to make things fit so that there's no problems with our little logical boxes. It doesn't always work. Sometimes it's, it's just, let it be. <laughs> well, you can, yeah, maybe. <laughs> or give you another example. Okay, give you another example. I mean, I can give a bunch off the top of my head. Have you guys read, um, what is it, where John chapter 3 Jesus says, no man has ascended into heaven. Jehovah's Witnesses use that verse, and they say, therefore, Enoch and Elijah are not really in heaven. That was, uh, and when Elijah appeared to Jesus, it was a vision. It wasn't real. That wasn't really Elijah. He's dead, you know, and he was just taken up into the sky and then dropped off somewhere. He didn't go to heaven. Because they say this verse, we're going to take this verse word for word, and it can't mean anything else. And it's, it, was, it, was a, it was a hyperbole. It was a generalization. Generally speaking, the majority of the time, nobody just goes and ascends to heaven. But there's a couple, exa- there's a couple exceptions. But Jesus didn't. So it, that's exactly. That's the, and so the Greeks will take, and they just, oh, my mind can't wrap around. And it's not a problem. Just you're worrying about little stuff too much. And that's the idea. Another example, Numbers 23, 19. Numbers 23, 19. And it's really hard to shake this because the problem is we are, we're worried that once you start getting out of these logical boxes, you've opened Pandora's box and now anything can mean anything. And the, the, in the Hebrew, it's, there's just some more common sense. You know, Ellen White says we are supposed to be guided by good theology and common sense, right? Have you guys heard that? God wants us to have common sense. And so you just, you have, I think the fact that there's a judgment and God knows your heart balances this idea that there is, in some areas, there's some gray stuff. But there's also a judgment. So don't lie to yourself because God knows if you're lying to yourself. So I think that kind of balances it. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Oh, well, that was the... It was kind of, though, like the, because I remember that, like, when you look at, um, you look at a box from a distance, low, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not perfect, and they wanted it to be perfect. So they made it false to look perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could kind of argue that it was kind of, they were going for their ideal. Yeah, anyway. Uh, okay, Numbers twenty three nineteen. God is not a man that he should lie neither the son of man, that he should repent. Anybody see a problem there already? The Jews use this verse against Christians. God's not a man, nor is he the son of man. Here you come and you say God is the son of man, right? They'll use that verse, you know, and that's, and, and my mind, and, and when I hear that, I'm thinking that's because you, you guys have been influenced by Western thought. You don't even understand your own scriptures you know, to the Jewish people. But notice something else it says. It says, he is not, 
neither the Son of Man, that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall it not do it? And hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Now compare that with Exodus 32, 14. Exodus 32, 14. Let me put a, let's put a time limit on this. We're at 4, 240. We want to cut it off by three. Is that good? Okay. That way I have a, put a border on me. What did I say? Exodus 32, 14. Somebody have it? Or in the King James, he repented. So there you go. You got one verse that says God doesn't repent. Another book by the same author, God repented. It's not a problem to the Hebrews. To the Greeks, you just your head just exploded, right? <laughs> so, so we have to we have to get away from this kind of in a box, cut and dry, you know. And you can give more examples like um, the tithe in the Old Testament. That it says that it would. Um, Three parts out of ten would go to this, three parts out of ten would go to this, and three parts out of ten would go to this. Well, that's only nine parts when you add it up. But in the, in, the, in the Hebrew, they understood what you meant. You meant a third, you know? And you could also look at that and possibly apply that to Daniel chapter 7. Three of the ten divisions were conquered, right? And it's, it could be a Hebrew idiom for a third. So that's another idea. Okay. Um, Let's see. Yeah, so you could compare Greek versus Hebrew mindset to like um, the Greek mindset is like little boxes and everything fits in this little box, whereas the Hebrew is more like a Venn diagram where there's a little bit of overlap, you know. But the interesting thing is the Greeks will have these things where everything fits in logical boxes, but then they'll do horrible atrocities that are argued because it's logical, right? So you look at the Catholic Church, and they had everything just systematized theologically, but they could excuse massacring people because, the, because they had a logical reason for it, right? You see what I'm saying? Whereas the Hebrew, it was more of an organic and natural type of um, thought pattern where maybe everything didn't fit in a perfect box, but the Hebrew scriptures our purity and righteousness, right? So what matters was more important. And then these little, and when you look at the New Testament, you see that the, the, the Pharisees and so forth that Jesus came to rebuke, they had been totally influenced by the Greeks because they would make their phylacteries nice and big, you know, the little box on their forehead that had the Ten Commandments on it, and yet they would be horrible people. <laughs> so it was like they ignored the important stuff. For the, yeah, anyway, you guys get the idea. Um, major and minors. Okay, another example of this. Um, uh, the Greek mindset, it's very logical, step-by-step -step logic, um, but it's also often built on a false premise. You know, for example, like the idea that the, um, the orbits are perfect, heavenly orbits are perfect, and that sounds logical, but the premise is everything outside of Earth must fit perfect, and um, perfection is defined by perfect symmetry and these kind of ideas. And that's not, that's a false premise, right? So it may sound logical, but it's not true. Another example is uh, the nature of Christ. And, and you look at this in the Gnostics. What the Gnostics said, and it came from a Greek mindset, they said human nature is so degraded and fallen that it's a sin just to be born. Therefore, the Gnostics declared, and that, that was a Greek. Greeks said everything on this earth is corrupted, right? And they came right out of the Greek mindset, and they came over to Christianity, and they brought that over. And they said having a human body means you're already a, already a sinner just for being born. Baby is condemned. Therefore, they argued Christ could not have really had a real physical body. And so Christ must have just looked like he had a physical body, but he really didn't. And that was the, the heart of Gnosticism. That's why First John comes in and he says, hey, you want to know? 
uh, how to tell true from false if they deny that Jesus came in the flesh. Don't even eat with them. Don't invite them into your home. You know, they're, they've been corrupted by that false mindset. You guys get, see how that logic works? It's logical, and they, it has an appearance of more purity, but it's, it's based on a false premise. And the false premise is being, having a human body, you're, you're a sinner already. Whereas the Hebrews could be okay with these conflicting ideas of having a sinful nature and fallen nature, but not being a sinner until you actually sin. It was, you could, you could make the two work together. You see what I'm saying? And so this is why, you know, and this is, this is kind of controversial, but this is why Jones and Wagner, their conclusion, and I think they were right, when you read First John, and it says that he who denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, the same as Antichrist, they came to the conclusion that what that means is that to deny that Jesus had a fallen nature is Antichrist. And when you think about it, if Adventists are correct, I, I'm kind of taking a little detour, but I think it's an important one. If Adventists are correct on, um, on who the Antichrist is, that's the only thing that works. That's the only way that works, because the Roman Catholic Church does not teach that Jesus didn't have a physical body. They teach he has a physical body. He actually ate. In fact, they represent it every day when they eat bread, when they eat the communion, right? The only way that they fit the definition of Antichrist in 1 John is if John, when he said flesh, he meant fallen nature, which is how he uses the word over and over because the Gnostics agreed with him on that. The Gnostics said no physical body, no fallen nature. The Catholic Church says, yeah, physical body, but no fallen nature. They agree on the fallen nature part. You see that? They both say Jesus couldn't have a fallen nature, so they both qualify as Antichrist, both the Gnostics and the Catholic Church. And so that, that, that's the only thing you can do with that. So that is a doctrine of Antichrist. It's the only way it works. Okay. Um, uh, that was kind of a <laughs> bold just drop, but it's, it's the only way it works. And again, it's from our, our Greek mindset. We can't reconcile ideas that don't seem to fit together, but that's... A, It is, uh, define docetism again. Yeah, I think, yeah, I'm not, I uh, brush myself up on theology, but I think you're right. I think you're right. Okay, um, so go ahead. <laughs> How do those two verses work? I see two possible explanations for this, and I don't know which one's right, but I'll offer you both, and you guys can figure it out yourselves. One is, it depends on the situation. It's kind of like a Jude thing, where Jude says, answer some, um, uh, save some with compassion, save others with fear. So that would be, it depends on the situation. Sometimes you need to answer a fool. Sometimes you don't need to answer him. Or you could say, like what you said, don't answer a fool according to, to his, his, the way he does it, lest you be like, so don't do it in his way, but answer a fool according to his foolishness, meaning about it. And I guess the dependence would be, what does the word according mean in Hebrew, which I don't know enough to say. So I could see both of them as being good lessons, though. Yeah. Yeah, Proverbs 26, 1, 5. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And then she'll also say he had all the past tense there. So yep. that, in that case, the context that yeah. if you look at the two statements, it's easy to get it in their context and use it for that very purpose of building up. Well, and she says herself that words don't have just one meaning. So, it, yeah, and we can flip out about it. So, oh, she contradicts herself, but the Bible does the same. And here's the thing, you have to, re you have to recognize that the Bible does this, 
If you don't, there's some people who lose their faith because they say, this says this and this says that, and I can't reconcile the two. And it's because you're approaching it like a Greek. And it's, you're making a mountain out of a molehill, and it's, and it's not a big deal. In the Hebrew mindset, it's, you know, it's more what matters. Go ahead. Well, probably a little bit of both, right? I mean, we're probably all a little bit of both. And by that time, you know, you have a society where you have people who are influenced by the Catholic Church, obviously, because that's all around them. Even when they came out, their new churches were very Catholic. But then they also were Bible scholars. So I'm sure they got influenced by the Bible, too. So it's probably a little bit of both. Yes. Yes. Well, this is an important point on Bible study. If you want to, if you want to get as far as like the meaning of words, a smart idea is to get a copy of the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament, and see which Greek word did they use to translate from a Hebrew word. And what did the Hebrew word mean? Don't go and say, what did the Greek word mean to all the Greeks in their society? Because if you do that, what did Hades mean to the common Greek? It meant this afterworld life that you live forever. But that's not the way Paul used it. He used it the way the Septuagint used it, which was, okay, we have this Hebrew word, sheol, the grave. What's the word we can use in Greek for it? Uh, it's the only one we can use, Hades, right? You don't go and you base your philosophy on the Greek meaning of the word. You base it on the Hebrew one. And so, and people, will, the scholars of the New Testament will tell you that the New Testament, even though it's Greek, the mindset's Hebrew. And it's, and a lot of it is like in Revelation and I think even in Peter's writings, it's a Hebrewized Greek where it doesn't always fit the Hebrew grammar structure or Greek grammar structure. It's, it's Hebrew in thought, just with Greek words. So that's, that's the ideal. And so you can, what is the Greek, what, not what's the Greek, what's the Hebrew word for it? And go back to the Hebrew. And that's, not that you need to be a Hebrew scholar, but just, yeah. Um, a lot of these things help when it comes to just basic ideas of definitions of words. What does salvation mean? What, is re, what does deliverance mean? What does um, redemption mean? When we hear those words, we have thoughts that come into our minds of definitions that we've been raised with. But what did the Hebrews mean when they said it? It was an Old Testament word describing a literal reality. Remember, Hebrews are reality-based. What did it mean to redeem someone? It meant to literally purchase them back from slavery. So in the Hebrew, with that understanding, you would never say, I'm redeemed, but I'm still a slave to sin. It just, it's, it's just a contradiction of terms. But because we've got this, we separate the word from what it means, and it's just this abstract thought, you can play with it once it's separated from reality and just make it mean whatever you want. So redeem just means I just, you know, I said a sinner's prayer one time or something, you know, I believe, yeah, boom, I'm, I'm redeemed. No, it means you're saved from, bought back out of slavery. You know what I mean? So when you get back to these real world concepts, all this false stuff just falls apart. It just doesn't work. Um, same thing with, uh, if you guys ever want to have fun, we won't do this now, but if you ever want to have a really good word study, study the, the Hebrew word um, goel, which was the word for, uh, it's the word for redeemer, but it's also the word for kinsman in the Old Testament. And in the, in the Old Testament, it's the same word. And you look in the King James, sometimes it's translated kinsman, sometimes it's translated redeemer. And the Hebrews understood that you could not be the redeemer unless you were kinsman. You, couldn't, you had to be both. And so the nature of Christ is you cannot pull it away from the fact. You, it, you just, it's inseparable from the gospel. Inseparable in the Old Testament. So study that word. It's really cool. Um, okay. Uh, taking the Bible overly literally, uh, Deuteronomy 6.8, I'll read it for you guys. Thou shalt bind them as a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. This is speaking of the Ten Commandments. 
the, you can tell the Pharisees were influenced by the Greek thought because they literally took a piece of paper, wrote down the commandments, put them on their forehead, put them on their hand, you know, which makes an interesting point about the mark of the beast. It's a replacement for the new covenant. It's supposed to be the law written on our hearts and replaces it with a different new covenant. Um, still being taken later, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's still, yeah. And I told people, they're waiting for a literal mark. And you gotta, you know, all you got to do is show people this verse and say, Revelations is quoting this. Was that literal? Did God really want us to put it on our forehead? No, so it's not. It's not literal. Um, Matthew 23, 5. Um, yeah, but all, they work, all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge their borders of their garments. Again, that's this idea of a, a box that has the Ten Commandments in it. Jesus is kind of showing that that's not what we're supposed to be doing. And so another thing that they'll do is they'll, they'll do the obvious. Their logic is paramount, but the obvious meaning of Scripture gets ignored because it doesn't fit their logic, right? That's, that's, that's kind of this Greek approach of, you know, my thought, my thought process, my logic must be met. And if it doesn't fit all these things, then... It's got a problem. So I'll give you an example. Mark 7. Uh, the Pharisees came to him and they had a problem. I won't read the whole story, but Mark 7, 1 through 13. They had a problem with the fact that he, he ate bread with defiled hands, right? They're making a mountain out of a molehill, right? And, um, and then, but then they ignored one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. And they reasoned a way around it, you know. But the obvious meaning was you're supposed to honor your father and mother. And they ignored it because they, but they were making a big deal about washing hands. So this is this kind of, this is an example. Another example you could give was the, um, the story of the Sadducees. The Sadducees coming to Christ and at, who didn't believe in the resurrection. And what was their argument? They had a, a, a theoretical situation you have seven brothers and the first brother dies no kids the next brother has the wife and then on and on and on in the resurrection who's she going to be now that is a very they thought they came up with a good argument and on the surface it is a good argument it's logical and you would say there's a big problem there therefore their logic overthrows the resurrection therefore you can't have a resurrection right but it's based on a false premise the false premise is that we're going to be just like we are here in heaven. And, and Jesus shows you, you guys' false premise is wrong. So that's, that's a perfect example of a, this kind of Greek argument. It's logical, it all fits, but wait a minute, right at the beginning, it's, it's false. So if you start false, you end false. So that's the idea. Um, I could give more stuff on this. I don't know, you guys have any questions on how this kind of thing works? Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 I mean, I think they were trying to be deadly and just, you know, deceitful, but on the other hand, it was what they embraced and what they thought they had to embrace. Absolutely. Absolutely. They approached it a certain way. If you, I'll, I'll give you just a second. If you, um, if you, if you help people to see this, kind of this, this, this mindset, then a lot of these verses where just the wording of something could, be, could lead you to be a little bit off, um, and you, people nitpick over just the wording of a verse that seems to overthrow 50 other verses, right, can be overcome. And you can do it by showing them um, reality, excuse me, like a... Like a you show them the word pictures. The Hebrews is more Hebrew in the Bible is more on word pictures, right? So somebody might go to Colossians two and say, "Hey, look, you know, it mentions the Sabbath. Therefore, the, you know, the Sabbath's done away with." And you give them a word picture of like, "Wait a minute, there's a temple in heaven with an ar- the Ark of the Covenant in there. It mentions it right there in Revelation. 
The Ark of the Covenant is in heaven. God's sitting on it. It's his throne. It's called the Ark of the Covenant. The Covenant is the Ten Commandments. Why would he have an Ark of the Covenant if there's no covenant in it? It's like literally underneath his throne, and you're saying that that's been thrown away? Like, when you look at these word pictures, it's ludicrous to, to think in these ways. It's like, you know, but if you just think in these, like, oh, well, this little tiny wording, you know, then you could kind of argue around it, all right? Sorry. I, the Bible, <laughs> I've tried to like look this up a little bit more, and you got to be careful because some of the guys out there that will will talk about this, they'll give a couple examples like I did, but then they'll say things like, you know, morality is kind of gray. You know what I mean? And you kind of got to be careful. So um, I've seen one cool book that I have on it that's I'll get you the name of it, but it's on the it's not on the necessarily on the Hebrew mindset, although it mentions it briefly, and I think they did a pretty good job on it. Um, it's on the um, the Hebrew language, and it's I think it's called Word Pictures, Hebrew Word Pictures, or something like that, and um, it's pretty good. And it gives like like a lot of times in the in the Old Testament when it mentions um, it'll mention abstract thought. And when you really look at the original Hebrew word, it wasn't an abstract thought. It was a word picture. So, like, for example, it says, the Lord is slow to anger. Uh, I forget. I think it's in Psalms. The literal words were, the, the word anger means a flaring of the nostrils. So, in, in Hebrew, it was, the Lord is slow to flare the nostrils. But we wouldn't get that, we, you know, but it's this, it's this word picture because they're very, you know, reality-based word pictures, and so, and it's harder to twist the meaning when it's, when it's something like that, but it's also hard to understand if you don't get the culture, yeah, but that's a good book, the Hebrew word pictures, I think it's on Amazon, anyway, any other thoughts or questions on this? Well, yeah. well, you can look at how it's used in the New Testament. You can look at how the Greek words are used in the New Testament, and that might double-check and balance the word out. But if you're still confused, I, I would recommend going and saying which word was used for that. Like, for example, when we say um, in Greek, in, in Revelation 20, the word abusos, and we say in the Septuagint, in the Greek Old Testament, when it says the earth was without form and void, the Greek word that they, they use to translate void, abusos. And so you see how I'm saying you, you kind of use what word did they translate from Hebrew to Greek? Because apparently the Hebrew to Greek translation was good because the New Testament writers quote it. And they, in the New Testament, they're almost always quoting the Septuagint. So apparently it was a good translation. So that's why I'm saying if you want to know what the Greek word means, look at the way that they translated the Hebrew into Greek. And that that helps. That really helps on justification. So would yes for having Greek words in the Greek Oh, it's obvious. <laughs> it's Greek all over the place, which leads to self contradictions. Yeah. yeah. So Exactly. Yep. Yep. He started with a false premise and he followed it through. Yep. Yep. Interesting, huh? That's why I Yep. Well, um, I think um, it's a good question. I, 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 there's strengths to both, and there's weaknesses to both. Obviously, if everything is very fluid and organic and poetic, 
you're not as precise. So that's kind of the weakness of Hebrew. It's not a very precise language. That's why they had to do Hebrew parallelisms, because you had to say it twice in two different ways to get the meaning across. That's why they had to do it, you know? And it turned out to be a beautiful form of poetry, but that was how you had to clarify. Whereas in Greek, you know, they got what, like seven different words for love? It was very precise. And so it's helpful to be precise sometimes, but then you can be overly precise based on false premises and, and come up to problems. So both are helpful, but um, you know, uh, it, seems like, it seems like the way that scripture does it, it's based on Hebrew with Greek helping out more than the other way around. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, totally. We're all like that, and, and checking yourself when you do Bible study too, but yeah, absolutely. Because I could be, I mean, I just ran into one this last week where you know, the church was pretty consistently they're having a challenge with the list of thoughts. Uh-huh. But when you realize, just in case you don't realize what you're doing this for, when you wake up to that, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It helps you to realize your bias, mm-hmm. your inbred. Um, incidentally, Jones, I think it was Jones, might have been both Jones and Wagner, but at least Jones, part of his fall was a simple Greek mindset type of mistake, right? You know what I'm coming out? She must be a false prophet. She said two different things. Simple. It's such a simple. And you know, it really wasn't that. There was a heart problem. That was an excuse. But that's so simple to solve that, you know? You know, I mean, it's just. Nate Wagner went out with the Greek. I mean, this is opening up all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. He went out with the Greek thought, too. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. He knew logically that the end time people would be sealed. He knew logically that they were not going to die. Uh huh. Because I'm sealed. I'm sealed. And so it just started snowballing. False premise. Yeah. People were sealed in Paul's day. <laughs> he talked, he says, you were sealed by the Holy Ghost. It doesn't mean they're going to live 2,000 years and see the second coming. Yeah, false premise. Any other thoughts or ideas? We, you can go more into this, but we're past our time. Um, I, can send, I have another lesson on this. I can send you the notes, Dustin. And then anybody who wants to can look more into it. But uh, it's cool. It's, it's cool stuff. It helps you to check yourself. And it really kind of, well, what's important? That's kind of the way that the, you know. And I always look at it as, again, the danger of thinking that things are, are gray and some things are gray is, well, that means you've opened the can and it's Pandora's box and everything, anything goes. But I think the balance to that is, God knows your heart, and there's a judgment. Are you just rationalizing things away, or is it is it really, honestly, you know, um, something that we're not sure on? Go ahead. 1883 failed because of two things. Absolutely. The law in Galatians. Yeah. It was either the one or the other. Law, one or the other. Or it was the moral law. Yeah. It was one or the other, black and white. Tell me which one it is. Yep. What was the other one's conclusion? Both. <laughs> How could it be both? <laughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. It's interesting. When you think about this stuff, it opens a lot of things up. A lot of stuff. Interesting. Easy. Yep. Uh-huh.
<laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you you think about it, and you send you know four years in abstract thought without any actual practice. That's that's a Greek approach to education. You know, in the Hebrew, to know meant to experience. Oh yeah, the, what's it, what's his name? School the um, belt of tr- belt belt of truth ministries. Absolutely, that guy's awesome. I would say the only way that you can trust it is like what Ellen White says: if the kids are first thoroughly grounded in and living present truth, then they can handle those educational systems. But if they're not, they can't handle it. They'll, they'll, they'll be influenced by it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We shall see. That's all. Yeah. Uh, Hebrew versus Greek mindset. Yeah. Well, should we close with a word of prayer? Okay. Somebody want? Well, I'll I'll just go ahead and say it. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for being beyond our cultures of all the various world cultures, Lord. And uh, we thank you that you bring us into heavenly society. And Lord, I pray that you would guide us and help us to realize our own biases and our own, um, our own mindset. Help us to correct for that. Help us to realize when we're, we're making errors in our approach to scripture in the spirit of prophecy. And also, Lord, help us not to lie to ourselves. Help us not to use this idea of some gray area as an excuse to lie to ourselves on things that you have made clear. And so I just pray that you would give us that balance and give us a sound mind. And uh, I pray that you bless this group here as they continue to study this topic. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.